Hello and welcome to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. As always, I'm your host, Chris Collins, in studio once again with the distinguished president of the Massachusetts State Senate, Senator Stan Rosenberg. And I appreciate you making time today because I know there's a lot of stuff going on. Always happy to come by. And uh, getting you out of Beacon Hill and out here, um, I know you're out here for, also for a fundraiser, but we have so much to talk about. The, the, the big story, of course, of probably the biggest story of the year or our recent memory, Kinder Morgan stopping work on the pipeline. Yeah. This is an issue that has affected just about every town in Franklin County, whether the pipeline is going to go through there or not. Yeah. People are very nervous about this. You called it a game changer. Was that one of the great understatements of all time? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm sort of an understated sort of a guy. <laughs> and you remember on this very show, uh, well, maybe a week or 10 days before yeah. Article 97 was first raised in relation to the Sandusfield pipeline. And sure enough, we're in court now and the Attorney General is uh, representing that the Commonwealth uh, is uh, Article 97 of our Constitution should be protected and not preempted by federal law. And there was a court uh, hearing uh, just recently in Pittsfield. Uh, the decision is due any day now. And uh, this thing could continue uh, well into, uh, into the, through the state court system because the next stop, if if uh, there's an appeal, uh, could be to the state Supreme Court, and then after that it could go to the federal district court, and then all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. So uh, time will tell, but um, the big news, as you say, was the, the uh, NED pipeline running across uh, northern um, Berkshire and Hampshire, Franklin, and uh, Worcester, and a little bit into Middlesex County. Uh, basically was pulled off the table by the uh, developers and uh, you know it's uh, it was such a big project they didn't end up with enough customers at this point etc 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 so the um, the good news is that uh, there it's been suspended and I think uh, most of us think it's going to be uh, killed permanently that's the hope but I mean I, I can't see a company spending that much money and just walking away and as as one town meeting member in Deerfield described it, it's like Ned the zombie. You know, you can't kill it. And, and with, depending on what happens with Article 97 and these tariffs, I mean, if in fact they're able to get Article 97 overturned, which I think I agree is a long shot, should people think, be, feel comfortable, I guess, that this thing is dead or not? So uh, I'm, I'm feeling that, that this is gone and people are refocusing now in Boston on uh, other questions relating to energy and our energy future. Um, that said, as, as you point out, they will keep fighting if they find that there's a way to bring it back. But at this point, there is no sign that there is uh, any intention or capacity to bring it back. We also still have some other things that we can do. So for example, um, uh, Representative Kulik put a letter together uh, to the speaker, 91 or two or three members of the House signed it saying that they wanted to make sure that nothing went into the energy bill that they're going to debate in the next coming uh, right. few weeks uh, that would uh, do anything to shift the cost of uh, infrastructure, utility-related infrastructure, onto ratepayers. And um, I said the same thing uh, in, in a press conference in Boston. And the, uh, uh, the, the idea that we should make an exception and somehow have people pay for infrastructure out of the normal course is doesn't make sense to me and I don't think that's fair. You know, in the end consumers pay for everything that they use, but we have a long established structure for how those things are done and there's no reason that we should be making an exception to that uh, in order to support pipelines. Isn't it the federal, are federal regulators the one that make the decision about the tariff? Or who makes the final choice? Uh, the Department of Public Utilities and uh -huh. the Commonwealth has a role in that. Um, Massachusetts state law could or could not aid or abet in that. Uh, and uh, FERC's role is whether or not they, whether or not the pipeline gets approved. Mm -hmm. That's their, uh, their, uh, their job and their, their portion of this whole process at the state level uh, we control things like crossing state lands and things like um, how how utility rates are set and and public infrastructure paid for I don't think the idea that DPU has a hand in this is going to be necessarily comforting to a lot of people because not at the moment 
But the, way, the way they handled the oversight of this, and they're supposed to be backing up the people in Massachusetts, and there are a lot of people that feel like, you know, DPU really wasn't there for us on this. So uh, I think I said this on, on your show before. The problem that I see is that both at the federal and the state level, the, the regulatory structure is designed to support the creation and maintenance of centralized uh, utility uh, energy related uh, infrastructure and systems and where we're heading is toward a system that's more decentralized yeah. where with solar and wind and hydro and conservation there's a whole series of things that are in the control of individuals individual businesses homeowners <laughs> institutions and so the system that we're working within though is structured to build large fossil fuel uh, fossil fuel driven production of energy and centralized dis, uh, distribution of that energy and so there's a big transitional process we're going to be going through we've already started it and it's going to last another 20 30 years as we transition from these you know large systems where the only thing you two things you think about is flipping the switch to get the power right. and writing the check to pay for it well the new world of energy is different than that and you get to make a lot of choices. You get to do a lot of things to help yourself bring your own costs down and to choose what kind of uh, power you want to use and possibly even create for yourself, such as solar power. Soon we'll have small windmills that you can attach to the roof of your house. Be a good thing. And there'll be all kinds of other technology that's going to be coming along. And uh, that will decentralize the system more so that you're going to be less reliant upon a central energy structure. No matter what happens with the pipeline, it seems the moratorium on new natural gas hookups is going to remain in place. Yeah, Representative Kulik and I are working on this. Uh, we've had uh, I've had a couple of meetings with um, with uh, Berkshire Gas, and uh, I got them to do a study about eight months ago to answer the question: If the pipeline doesn't get built, what can you do? Uh, that study came uh, came out. It has a lot of options. They're all expensive. Many of them take time. And uh, Steve and I met uh, 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 on a recent Friday. I'm not sure what the viewers are going to see this, so I'll yeah. just say on a recent Friday, uh, we met with them, and we're going to meet and talk with them uh, er, uh, again uh, in about two weeks, and then we're going to uh, try to set up regular conversations until we have a plan for lifting the moratorium. This is not an easy matter, but uh, we need a plan B, and uh, we're working with them to encourage that. We've also met with the Department of Public Utilities and with the Secretary of Energy to determine what the state's role should be with regard to moratoriums, because right now there is no role. Right. And so we're thinking outside the box now because we know that the pipeline's gone and we need to get on to plan B and there is no plan B and we want a plan B as soon as possible so that the moratorium can be lifted uh, in Franklin and Hampshire County because Berkshire Gas they don't have a moratorium in Berkshire County only in Hampshire yeah. and Franklin right. because it's really two service regions in the same company but operating a little bit separately not administratively or business but in terms of where the supply comes yeah. from and how it gets delivered. I know when I talked to Chris Farrell about this, when the moratorium issue first broke and, and people were saying, oh, it's just a, it's, it's a tactic, it's a ploy to try and make it easier for the pipeline to come through. And, and I asked him about it and he said, why would a company, a for-profit company, not sell a commodity it had access to? He says, it doesn't make any sense. We want to sell gas. We just don't have any capacity for it. Which brings up another question. So how do you get more gas in? And, and liquefied natural gas seems to be the one that everybody's talking about. But I know there are some fire chiefs, especially here in, in our viewing area, that aren't real wild about the idea of tankers of liquefied natural gas coming in. I mean, it could be a disaster in the making, potentially. Liquefied natural gas uh, would be trucked in, be delivered to Waitley, which is where their big uh, uh, facility is here in, uh, in this uh, eastern, uh, sorry, the western portion of their region. No, sorry, this is the eastern portion yeah, of right. the Berkshire gas region. And uh, they need, uh, you know, two or three more tanks. They're allowed to do up to three more at that. They're already licensed to do that. But then there's also cost associated with it. And unlike the electric company, the electric company has to give you electricity. Yeah. 
Gas companies do not. Right. When they run out, they run out. They can't take new customers. They can't take new customers. We don't like that idea. We don't like that idea at all because if, if we've gotten people excited about using the product or the commodity, it ought to be available to them. And especially if three streets over it's available yeah. and you happen to build three streets further east or west or north or south and it's not available to you, you're not going to be too happy about that. It's also so. not that different from, say, a, a Comcast, which doesn't have to provide cable service to areas that are too rural. Yeah. You don't have more than four houses to service. So, I mean, I, I guess I understand and the business model is what it is, but you don't believe that this moratorium was just a tactic. You think this is real? I know I don't. Well, based on my conversations with the Department of Public Utilities and the review of all of the planning that they've been doing in the past, this um, gas shortage was predicted by Berkshire Gas well before NED was even on the, on the radar screen. And once NED appeared, it became the solution for this problem from Berkshire Gas's point of view. And uh, the way I described it in a meeting recently with the Department of Public Utilities is that Berkshire Gas is going through the grieving stage right now. Sure. There's still, you know, when we talked with them, it was a week after this happened, and Steve and I had a meeting with them, and uh, it sounded like people who were, in, who, who were grieving. They were still talking about why NED was so important and why it was the perfect solution and why it would have helped the whole region, and they just couldn't let go of it. And it took quite a bit of conversation to get them back to talking about Plan B because they were so focused on the loss that they had just sustained because they were counting on that in order to serve their customers. Well, it certainly wouldn't have helped the farmers. And we're going to talk about agriculture because, and this is kind of breaking news, this actually was announced this week, you put out a press release about a new omnibus agricultural bill, which is the, the first um, omnibus bill. Yeah, you know, of. we're used to doing one bill on one subject at a time. So fix this problem in one bill, fix that problem in another, and go on and on and on and on. But here, for the first time ever that anyone can remember, we did an omnibus agriculture bill, and there's about 10 or 11 existing pieces of legislation that got perfected and rolled into the bill. And then there were three or four or five other ideas that got added. So it's a significant piece of legislation. And it'll go over to the House of Representatives now. And they will add some additional ideas, I'm sure. It'll go into a conference committee. And it will uh, hopefully land up on the governor's desk before July 31st. And Steve and I, Steve Kulik and I, do a lot of work in agriculture, he in the House, I in the Senate, because we represent such a, sure. uh, an agriculture-rich uh, area, and we also have a lot of innovators here. And so people think up really good ideas about how to add value to farming so that it can, people can make a living at it, and, and also preserve the open space and add to the robustness of our tourism industry, where people come and you know, ride around, go pick apples, and enjoy the beautiful countryside. Uh, because we have so much open space and, and farms in production and, and nurseries and orchards, et cetera. So uh, it was an attempt to try to be helpful to the agricultural industry. And so we've got some provisions in there that relate to farmers markets, um, small craft brewers. Uh, about a year, year and a half ago, we allowed local um, uh, uh, wineries to uh, sell their product samples and sell their product at farmers markets. Well, um, we want to do the same thing now for people who do craft beer. A lot of people doing and that. And a lot too. of people doing that. And they've got their, their home breweries. And then we have these wonderful smaller breweries that have been created. And it's a chance for, for their products to become, uh, for people to sample their products and, and get to know them. And, um, you know, uh, there's some other things. Uh, another one that we're really excited about is um, to help returning veterans find uh, a potential career in agriculture and uh, it gives them the opportunity to participate in education and training and experiential uh, efforts so that they can uh, learn about and see if agriculture is something that they want to do and many of them may have already wanted to do it decided to serve their country first and now want to come home and go into the family farm or go into some other um, uh, aspect of uh, agriculture and we want to try to encourage that. I think that's an especially creative idea and, and you know we're always looking for new ways to help veterans and to increase agriculture and to talk about killing two birds with one potential stone. Yeah. Uh, it's exciting and you know if you've been 
you know, over in Iraq and Afghanistan, it wouldn't be too bad after getting shot at to be able to just plow some fields for a while and, you know, get your and mind get your mind square. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, Senator Gobi from um, uh, uh, Worcester County was the author of, uh, of the bill. She's the chair of the Committee on Natural Resources and Agriculture. She did a terrific job, and we're very excited about it. Now, it's got to go to the House. Any idea where the governor stands on this? Is this something he's in support uh, of? Uh, I'm assuming that they this isn't even on their radar screen yet because it's not sort of an A-list issue for the state government right now. It's, you know, got to get the energy bill done, got to deal with the, the TNC. This is Uber and Lyft problem and vis-a-vis -vis taxes. I mean, uh, taxis in relationship to taxis. And, and he's got a municipal relief bill that he's hoping will get passed. We've got... Um, what he calls an economic development bill, I call um, uh, the Massachusetts Economy and Workforce Development Bill. So there's a bunch of things that are on the A list and on the big screen. Um, we think this is important, but it's not. Uh, it's not on the A list for a lot of people. But if we get a good bill to his desk, uh, I, I bet he'll uh, be excited to sign it. How has he been to work with? I, I know I'd seen some recent concerns raised about differing views on certain issues, differing priorities. Uh, the last time we were in, you said that things were going pretty well. Yeah, uh, they're still going very, very well. Uh, the way I would characterize it is year one for Governor Baker and year one for me as the new Senate president, we were getting our feet on the ground and we were learning what we had to do and how to make things work within our respective jobs. And, and his job, you know, the exe he's the chief executive. And so his job is to manage and make things work. He's also got to decide uh, what laws to sign and what laws to propose uh, because he has the right to do that, as do we in the legislature, uh, that is to, to decide what, uh, what laws to propose. And so um, when he came in, there was some fiscal problems that we had, I don't know, a month or six weeks of unending snowstorms. The MBTA uh, broke down and the commuter rail. And then he found out that the connector wasn't working as we were trying to come into line with with federal uh, requirements on the healthcare connector. And then uh, he discovered that these big problems at DCF and, the, and there was something going on over at the registry. So he had, this was like, hey, this, he's on his A game because it's all about management. Right. Analyze the problem, dissect the elements of it, find solutions, manage and motivate people to solve those problems and to apply new thinking and new approaches to getting the thing done. And you'd have to say he did a, a really good job of dealing with all that. After all, he went in, and he saved, he rescued the largest health insurer in Massachusetts, which was just about on the rocks, and he brought them back to life. And now, the I think in the last three or four years, at least once or twice or three times, they were the number one rated in uh, health insurer uh, insurance system in the state. So you have, you know, he's, he knows how to make things work. Now we're into a different, uh, different uh, chapter now, because now we're starting to talk about policy and where, you know, we have disagreements, but without, again, without being disagreeable uh, on the uh, on charter schools. And, you know, the Senate's position is we can't just talk about charter schools. We have to talk about all the children and all of their education. And for 20 years, all we've been talking about is how many more charter schools. Well, what about the kids who are in traditional classroom seats? And so um, diff a difference of opinion there about how to look at the problem. Uh, the uh, public accommodations bill, we've seen what's happened in Georgia, North Carolina, Mississippi. They're embarrassing themselves and they're losing business because Terrible. of their attitude um, toward people who are different and different in a way that maybe a lot of people have trouble understanding, but that's not the point. The point is we value diversity in our society and our constitution protects our right to be different as long as we don't harm anyone else. And he uh, is still struggling with that piece of legislation. Again, disagreeing, well, he hasn't actually disagreed yet because he said, I don't support discrimination, but I don't know if I can sign the bill yet because I haven't seen what the langu final language is. So people are trying to give him some room to get there and, and hopefully sign it. Let's talk a little more about that because as we're taping this show, it is Pride Weekend in Northampton, which is mm -hmm. 35th year of that. And, uh, and actually in Franklin County, there's a, a gay 5K road race happening uh, a few hours from now as we're taping this. So a lot of discussion about LBGD issues and the transgender rights bill that you're working on 
I mean, depending on who you talk to, it's either the greatest idea ever or it's, it's really scary, as you mentioned. Even the governor, as intelligent a guy as he is, I mean, the issues like this, for some reason, make certain people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. give, me, give me the lowdown on this bill. What would change if this passes? So uh, under current law, if you are a transgendered individual, you cannot be discriminated against in employment or renting an apartment or getting a bank loan. But let's take, for example, that you work in a restaurant, you're a transgender individual and you work in a restaurant, you haven't been denied your rights to work there. At the end of your shift, if you go into the dining room and sit down, the management can ask you to leave because someone in the dining room feels uncomfortable with your presence. Wow. Because there's no protection on public accommodation. That's different than employment and housing, et cetera. So you could work a shift Go into the dining room at the end of your shift, and if someone doesn't like that you're there, they and the, the manager, boss can kick you out. And the manager can come up to you and say, I'm sorry, uh, but I'm going to have to ask you to leave because some of the customers are uncomfortable. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a judgment call by the manager, but also it is legal. That shouldn't be the case. No. Well, everybody focuses on the bathroom issue. It's because the people who don't like this idea at all basically have found a point in the sort of in the picture that they could sort of mm, just twist and twist yeah. and twist. You know, and the, the reality is that there's law right now that an individual who enters uh, a restroom of uh, either gender uh, in, in a situation where they're going to harass, assault, uh, otherwise, um, you know, interfere with the, another person's use of the facility. Uh, there are laws uh, that would result in, uh, in in arrest and prosecution, and that won't change after this bill. So, an individual who has a long, a deep, deeply have, there's a particular legal phrase. I think it's a deeply held. Um, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the language, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to do it again. Yeah. So, uh, but the point is that um, if you impersonate, you're not the real thing. I if see. you're the real thing, you can't be interfered with. I see. Well, I think that there are, there are certain people, and I've read this, who, who classify being transgender as having a psychological disorder. And, 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 and again, I think that, that that speaks to the ignorance, I think, but this is a medical opinion that, that is being tossed around as another wedge issue. Yeah, as, as far as I understand, there is nothing in the official medical mental health uh, literature that says that this is uh, an illness. This is a, uh, an individual's situation, who they are, who they feel they are, no matter what body they were born in, if they f don't feel the gender of the... Uh, if they don't feel like they are that gender and they feel the other gender, that is not considered, as far as anybody's ever told me, from the medical community or academic or science community, uh, some form of mental health problem. When you started in the legislature in the early 90s, did you ever think you'd be in a situation where you'd be debating a bill like this? No. And how far we've come? I mean, look at, look at how far society has come. I mean, same-sex marriage is legal in a lot of states, including yeah. here. We were the first ones to do it. I think eventually it's going to be legalized nationwide, and now you're talking about transgender rights, which is something nobody talked about. Right. Eventually, this will presumably be upheld by the Supreme Court as well, U.S. Supreme Court as well. But uh, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, when the same-sex marriage debate started, uh, there were, weren't even 50 legislators who were prepared to support it. After three and a half years of public education and thinking, you know, families talking with each other, peoples in, people in communities of faith and in the workplace and in the, in the uh, you know, civic clubs, society's uh, minds and hearts opened to the difference and people got to the point of saying, well, if it's okay for me and it's okay for my child, then why shouldn't it be okay for my cousin's child or my brother or sister's child who might be gay? And so it's, it's really, it's been transformative in this uh, society that we've uh, moved uh, this far, and this is the next step. I'll tell you something that's always bugged me, and it really bugged me when you got named, or you were going to be named Senate President, is, you know, I've been covering you since you got into the business, which is right around the time I got into the business of journalism. And when you got the, the big position, 
All I used to read in the Boston papers was the first openly gay state Senate president in history. And I'm thinking, you know, there's so much more to Stan Rosenberg than sexuality. But yet that, that's all you were defined by in the early days. I think mm-hmm. now people are starting to realize it's more, you know, you're, you're more than just a one-issue guy. Mm-hmm. But it always, you know, I'm always like, you know, these guys don't get it. This guy has been in, on the forefront of so many different things for so many years. And all you can talk about is who he chooses to, to, to love. And that always bugged me. It's really, uh, it's really odd. Uh, and that's been part of the transformation to see how uh, the political media, you know, the media that, yeah. that works around Boston, how they view and handle things. And it's, it's, really, it's really quite amazing. If I ever write the book, there's going to be a whole chapter on this subject. But has it gotten better? I mean, since you've, you've been in there a year now, I mean, is that no? And there was also a big deal about you being the first Jewish state senate president. And but for, that was and, much that was secondary to the, yeah. the, the, the gay thing. And, and probably the first former foster kid. So, yeah. but you know, these are things that are part of your life, but they don't define you. They don't. It is not who you are because you have this label that. But the press in uh, the political press in Boston is constantly having to label and that is troubling and it's not just with me but you know when uh, when i got uh, when i gathered the votes and knew that this was uh we were heading in, into um uh, the transition with senate president murray she said i just want to tell you stan um you know there's so much you're going to learn on the job that nobody can explain to you now but uh a couple of things you just need to know you are now from now on, because you've got the votes now, you, um, you're in the spotlight, there's a target on your back, yep. and there are people, and no matter how hard you work and how sincere you are, there are people who are gonna be looking to find ways to uh, diminish what you're doing. And I don't, and I also think that they've, what's been noticeable is you know, the sky didn't fall. The earth didn't open up and swallow the Commonwealth because we have an openly gay state Senate president who also happens to be Jewish. I mean, I and, think... And that we have same-sex marriage in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and now throughout the country. But do you think that your push for the transgender rights bill is going to resurrect that, uh, that argument that you maybe know, you're it, trying to do this because of... It who could, you but it's, this bill is the right thing to do, and um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens uh, on... Uh, w- again, we're recording... Uh, the week before we're going to be taking the vote, and I think it's going to be a very strong vote in the Senate, and I believe a bill will be on the governor's desk by July 31st, and uh, it's not going to get there without the majority in the House also. Well, is it a veto-proof and, majority, uh, you think, if you veto? Uh, that, that would be, uh, a, I believe both the Speaker and I hope that we will have veto-proof majorities oh boy, if he vetoes, in the event. If he vetoes, oh, that would, that would really be a, a I, I, bad move, I think. I suspect that uh, he'll... He'll, he'll think very hard about this and end we, up in the right place. We have, a, we have just scratched the surface. We have a lot more to talk about, which we'll do in part two of our interview. But that's going to conclude part one of my two-part conversation with Senate President Stan Rosenberg. Thanks for watching Beacon Hill Update. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.